So last time we talked about Earth, uh, land, the future land use map for Broadway. The land use map fundamentally describes density, like the number of housing units that would be allowed typically, or the uh, number of employees uh, or square footage of a commercial building. The land use map isn't really a design document, but there's a lot of interest and concern about design on railway. Um, and it seemed that the conversation we were trying to have about the land use map, describing density, was frustrating and incomplete to some or many people in the room who wanted to think about design. And so we talked about trying to make recommendations um, for, uh, for improving design outcomes on Broadway um, that would complement the future land use map and zoning. And so an example I wanted to share with you of the kind of buildings or new development that um, seems like it's uh, allowed or encouraged on Broadway now and it can't happen, and it's different than some prior planning efforts laid out, would be, for example, um, a restaurant that's, uh, that has a drive through window that doesn't have any sort of orientation or relationship to Avenue B. Um, so there's not a pedestrian, a vibrant space on Avenue B. Um, most of the site can be occupied by a parking lot um, instead of having to be uh, used for a building with more people with maybe the, the parking and the structure next door, uh, more dense parking. Um, it wouldn't have like a public plaza or gathering place and um, there'd be driveways interrupting the sidewalk. Um, and so that's, that's actually contrary to a, a lot of guidance that's already been included in prior plans that wasn't actually followed up on in enacting the Unified Development Code mm -hmm. and the Zoning Code. So what we'd like to talk about doing and including in the Midtown Plan is, is integrating the recommendations from the Midtown Brackenridge Plan, which was created in 2011, into, the mid -tech, into this big town plan. That would involve having a whole process, a whole planning and design process dedicated to that effort. After we're done with this plan, it would have to involve neighborhood representatives, other stakeholders, um, and it would really be a, a detailed process to, to create new design standards um, and amend the zoning code. Um, we have to involve lots of other government agencies really focusing on, on those topics <coughs> rather than right now we are spread a little bit thinner across the whole Midtown area. Um, and again, we'd start after completing the Midtown plan. So I'd like to share with you some of the recommendations from that plan. Unlike the land use map, they included a map of character areas providing transitions to Bracket Ridge Park recommendations for neighborhood transitions so that they're not abrupt and, and jarring to people that live in the neighborhood adjacent. Um, they encourage some more urban areas uh, and some less neighborhood-oriented commercial areas. Uh, there's uh, a couple dozen pages of these recommendations. And, um, you know, for example, just about the Brackenridge Park transition there's a couple of pages of recommendations that talk about how uh, buildings are encouraged to incorporate passages between Broadway and Avenue B for people to, to pass through between the two, where Avenue B should be activated as a, as a, pedestrian, as a pedestrian place, uh, potentially making can tell the person channel a landscaped and valued water feature that people can enjoy. Um, incorporating a small urban plaza uh, amidst buildings, um, encouraging all kinds of other amenities like street trees, having buildings that really are oriented to the street. Um, it goes through many topics, including potential building heights, um, the percentage of a building that's supposed to be up against, uh, up against the sidewalk and facing the street. Um, and the like. And so the idea is, I'm not trying to make you absorb these actual recommendations, but rather give you a sense uh, for, for how much thought went into those. Uh, they are pretty recent, and at the last planning team meeting, 
planning team members expressed that they were interested in, in sticking with these and, and actually trying to get them implemented going forward. Um, so uh, here's an example of a, of a passageway between two buildings, for example, that could connect Broadway and Avenue B. Uh, a plaza where people can gather, um, an activated streetscape, um, low impact development stormwater features, uh, stormwater management features to allow rainwater to soak into the ground instead of uh, running off quickly and with lots of pollution to area rivers and streams. Uh, this is another example of a, of a pedestrian passage, uh, actually from Chicago. Um, and, uh, and another urban plaza that might be appropriate for one or another place on Broadway and probably not for others. Um, um, so, again, encouraging courtyards, paseos, greens, um, pedestrian streets, and basically trying to encourage that by allowing a few more housing units or a little bit more height concentrated into one place to allow some extra public space for people to gather and enjoy on the side. Um, here's an example of another recommendation where right now, one could travel without telling anyone through one of these businesses' commercial parking lots, theoretically, to travel from Broadway to Avenue B, right to Fall Mary. There's really several blocks without a street connecting the two. And so the Bracket Ridge, the Midtown Bracket Ridge Church recommendations would really encourage a pedestrian passage that's aligned with the neighborhood street so that it's intuitive to exit the neighborhood and find one's way across to a uh, an enhanced and activated epidemic. And so all of these recommendations, they were very thorough, but they didn't, there wasn't a follow-up process um, uh, to actually amend the, the actual rules. So they remain recommendations that can guide TERS decisions on what kinds of projects they invest in, but it's not in the code. So one can still come, and oftentimes the easiest pathway to development is, is a more suburban and status quo. Uh, single story on use with lots of surface parking. Yeah, so there's a concern on the part of the neighborhood. If the bleed over into the neighborhood, what's that transition between Broadway and four story buildings or five story buildings? We, don't, we have the Monsters Tower there at Hildebrand, and we don't want to see that all the way down. Undoubtedly, and that was uh, a big part of our discussion last time um, that I remember. And so the, we, we also have some land use map recommendations that, that speak to that, but the design recommendations in the Midtown Bracket Ridge Church Plan um, are, are partly about um, neighborhood transitions from Broadway to one street over or a few properties over in some cases where the residential is, isn't separated by a street from Broadway. It's just a, you know, uh, 100 feet away uh, across a couple of the properties. And so, um, the, 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 the Midtown Bracket Ridge plan from 2011 actually identified some ways in which the current code allows transitions that are, it, it said, were too abrupt. Um, and that they, and there are some recommendations to actually make sure that the transition is smoother and you don't have steeply rising buildings coming right you know, out, of the, out of the neighborhood next to Broadway. And so, the idea in recommending that we implement those design, uh, those design guidelines and create actual regulations out of them, it still leaves an entire design process to actually create what the real rules would be. Uh, so we, we don't have to um, necessarily be okay with every last detail of these to, in order to recommend that we implement a complete you know, a planning process that includes stakeholders. Uh, to work on them going forward. Um, and so, again, this is the, the design recommendations. Instead of us coming up with a new set um, in the planning department in the midst of this planning process, the idea is to use what was really thorough work um, uh, from pretty recently um, and, and, work, and work from there uh, after, the, after the Midtown plan is um, done. And so, and that church plan goes The scope of the church plan 
Let me see if I can get us back to the map instead of just describing it. There's a line that's green and blue running through here that's Broadway. And so typically it's just within one block of Broadway to Margaret or Catalpa. In some places, Margaret and Catalpa don't continue, but it's, 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 it runs pretty tight to the existing commercial areas. And then the north south is? This is Alamo Heights and Burr Road. Um, and this is I-35. They also included recommendations for areas near the Pearl and other <coughs> areas. And that wasn't something that we talked about as much last time, and so I'm not sure if we would recommend implementing these design guidelines and actually following through with, with the rules. From well, a transportation perspective, there's also underneath the lower uh, pass there is a parking facility that's going to be. Uh, between the highway interchange, the highway interchange of I-35 and 281 and 37 here. And it's uh, it's been laid out, and I think it has some you know very important acoustics. It has um, two actually for the reinvestment zone for involved. And it looks like we're going to spend quite a bit of money to get that worked out. But as you can see, there's green areas in there. And it's really, I guess what we're trying to focus on is uh, shuttle from that area to other parts of either Broadway or downtown so that we can cut down on the congestion. And the church's board is, is there, is it? Being funded by the next time, yeah. we are putting money into that. Yeah. So, there's also money inside. All right. Yeah, so another issue um, that we might talk about more going forward is shared parking and how to actually initiate. There's, there's a lot of talk about the parking should be shared, but how do, you, how do you get the first developers to start sharing and get somebody to build a little extra? To share. So that's something that uh, we, well, we might have to talk about some more going forward. So, um, so again, it's an important complement, we think, to the land use map uh, to provide some extra uh, certainty around what uh, a, a category of land use map could mean in the future for an area that's undoubtedly extremely important, not only to the neighborhood, but to uh, the region as a whole. Um, are there any thoughts about that or, um, or concerns? And again, it's, it's something that would be you know, open to further discussion once it's in the draft mid plan. So, I just want to clarify. So, if I follow you, I'm going to go to this and see what those land use, and I'll see a complementary design guideline criteria. Is that what I'm hearing? So, is that how I would look at it if I were a resident, a developer, or city staff? It's going to be laid out there for me. Recommend you, and is there some design guidelines? So we wouldn't copy um, many. We wouldn't copy pages from this from the, the Midtown Bracket Bridge plan into the Midtown plan. But it would be uh, referred to, and there would be idea there would be a whole planning and design process after this to really make them part of the rules. And then when somebody wants to develop or somebody wants to know what the rules are for a developer because they're concerned about what's being proposed, the design standards would ultimately be included in the, the code, the city code for development. Yeah. And that plan is within the planning department's website that you can get it? Um, I will send the planning team a link to the, to the plan. Yes. I have a question. I'm sorry, colleague, the party on this. Uh, is the deliverable for this plan going to be in uh, I mean, I mean, it'll be an official form? Is there going to be a way to kind of go with like the interactive map and see you know some of these uh, with you know, the zone the zone areas and you 
and some of the recommendations that lay out an actual uh, sort of interactive GIS map? Um, an interactive GIS map, aside from the web page that I showed you earlier, um, is not part of what we're going to create. No. But it will be essentially, um, there will be a map um, within the web page, and then below it, all of the associated text and photographs illustrating what we're talking about um, to go along with the map. Yeah, the shape, uh, files, uh, the shape uh, files will also be how the developed services are on this web page. So the updated menus would be on the online zone as well. Okay. Yeah, and there is a citywide map that has all kinds of interactive information like zoning and streets, neighborhood association boundaries, future life use map. After the city council adopts the future life use map, it will be incorporated into that. But is that good? Hers, uh, is that a separate part of the plan? Uh, when I'm trying, because you're talking about two things, the same term tomorrow and the land use plan. But then the church is a separate plan. So we have to go look at South Lake's house to see what its guidelines are. It's yeah, the we so the benefit, one of the benefits of an online plan is that we can have a link to it right there. And so you just click. And go over to the first. So now um, let's talk about the land use map on Broadway. So there was concern at the last meeting about neighborhood impacts um, uh, in Westport Alliance, Government Hill, and Mackey Park uh, from development not in the neighborhood per se, but out on the commercial corridor and just the with the amount that's happened um, in the River North area of downtown and around the world, people are starting to feel traffic and parking impacts, um, and there's some concern about more of that uh, coming in the future. Uh, we talked about, again, design transitions uh, with Brackenridge Park, <coughs> and just the idea that there's a potential for it, if it, you just have a land use map in this place without, without the design standards, it might not be the best that it can be. And the Broadway corridor, given how important it is to the whole region, needs uh, to be, it's a really good design. And so that's some of the stuff we just talked about. But let's also talk about some of the ideas for responding to those grants and concerns. This is the map we talked about last time. And the darkest purple represents the highest density kind of mixed use. So the most people living and working using an area. We had that designated up by the Hildebrand at the AT&T sector, for example, at and building. And as you approach um, Joseph Tate Street and Grayson Street in these areas, there's also, there's also a medium density mixed use. It's still a mixing that we're trying to encourage with people living and working and shopping and paid services in pretty close proximity to one another. And that's the medium shape purple. And then there's more of a neighborhood mixed use that might have something like the residential density you would have in a set of townhomes, but it could also have commercial people with it. And so that's the slightest purple. And so there's concern about impacts to Mackey Park, uh, the amount of traffic coming through Government Hill. Uh, to access I-35 at Braunfels, um, and uh, parking impacts in Westport Alliance, and so on. It was a long conversation, and I can't summarize my other concern that we talked about. But the basic message that I heard was that let's try to lower, uh, let's try to have less density in some places along the corridor, and leave some nodes of, of uh, higher density where more people would still um, have an a more of an opportunity to, to live or work or visit and get multiple things done at the same time, uh, encounter uh, a friend or somebody new, uh, hang out at a quality public plaza, and the like. And so we looked at the map, we looked at some of the other work we've done that I'll show you in the next couple of minutes, and we made some, some discussion 
some changes for discussion purposes. Essentially lowering the density that we would recommend along several areas next to Mankey Park neighborhood north of the park, some areas next to Mankey Park south of the park, next to Westward Alliance, um, to uh, within a couple hundred feet of Josephine. And, um, but still needing some of these nodes of, of density and recommending that we still have, you know, like some, some pretty urban development there where you'd have uh, a few to several stories if the design standards allow for it, um, and where that density could be used to, um, to help incentivize uh, some of the public improvements that are envisioned, like the highest quality sidewalks or the paseo between uh, Broadway and Avenue B or Little Plaza. One thing, just to note, uh, in that area just below Hilton Grant, right by the AT and T building, there's a there's a, a flood problem issue that yeah. has to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, when we built the intersection area, uh, Broadway and Hilton Grant, re, re, uh, I say reconstructed it. We put a pipe down over to the uh, Riverside over there, and it's quite large. But we didn't, as a part of that project, we couldn't take it down any further. So I have a check with capital improvements and Mike Bisbee about when the Broadway improvements are made, if the scent of the, uh, the watershed issues are going to be dealt with. But I think they are, but I'm not sure exactly. That's yeah. something we need because more the more density you have, the higher you know, the longer range is now. Particularly south of the park, the more the yeah. issue is the bigger one. South of Vancouver. South of the actual yeah. park. Yeah. Right. So yeah, we have more work to do with San Antonio River Authority to if they have recommendations ready that we could incorporate into the plan. Um, if not, you know, um, we also don't, don't have to do that. Uh, plans have been done in the past that recommended some amount of mixed use here with you know, the overall recommendation that, yeah, before anything really happens here, we gotta address the flooding problems. Um, but for the meantime, we'll, we'll use this land use map. So, uh, to, to make, to, to select these areas and to lead more density, we looked at where we think transit stations might be located, high quality transit stations in the future where you might have frequent service, uh, such as at Hildebrand and Broadway or uh, Grace and Broadway. We looked at some of the gateways into Ranch Park that were addressed in the, or, excuse me, some of the gateways into Brackenridge Park that were addressed in the Brackenridge Park Master Plan, like at the San Antonio River and Whitney Museum, at Mankey Park proper. Um, and a few other locations, such as at uh, Lions Field and Mulberry. Um, and uh, we also looked at some other maps and uh, you know, some of the work that we did with the planning team back in the fall. And these seem like if we're going to leave some recommendations for higher density, it would be around some of these places that would be transit oriented or gateway oriented to the park where you have you know, people converting. <coughs> Um, sort of encourage use of the park, encourage people using the park to discover something new on Broadway as well. Yeah, and I think, I mean, last time we met, the concern was coming from the lady and the river authority was, you know, by putting all this density on the side of the park, was also erasing the park. So it was the view. The view. The view. The view. Yeah, so that's something where the design standards would help promote views and, uh, and try to concentrate uh, development into you know, one place or another and leave some new corridors instead of just having the walls, you know, something the folks described as being a concern. And at the Whitney Museum and San Antonio River Authority were, um, were pretty integrally involved in the planning process to create those design standards. Um, and so we'll certainly need to have some more discussion with them because um, uh, Maurice McDermott is in here tonight. 
and Cole uh, has had to leave a representative from Sarah. Uh, and Lynn Bobbitt, our representative for Breckenridge Park Conservancy, is in with us tonight. Um, so that's the same set of maps I showed you. And this is just for reference, in 2011, this was what the map had. It had the highest density mixed use next to Breckenridge Park, typically. But, um, but it came along with the expectation that, hey, we're going to implement these design standards. And that's going to address a lot of those potential issues with new corridors and making sure it's high quality. So the land use map got adopted, and the design standards didn't end up being codified or turned into actual. So, Gary, can I make a statement about that? Yeah. I think the narrative that we put in this is as important as the land use. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we spend enough time really honing what it is we wanted to say. So for example, if we're going to say yes to higher density, where in the verbiage we say yes to the standards or the zoning or other things need to safeguard respect to neighborhood, respect to other things that are there. I'm not sure if we spend enough time, I don't feel like we spend enough time looking at the narrative around the plan. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to put that on the table. OK, thanks. And there should be some architectural design issues that, in fact, when we do our tax increment reinvestment, if we look at reinvesting a particular property, they have to meet certain standards, so they're not going to build a shaft on the property. Okay, they have to meet some certain design. Right, so to that point, the narrative is just as important as the map, and I think there needs to be some more due diligence with that. So it's a full package, and then we're not just recommending that half of it just the map get implemented to allow more density. Well, just the nuance of what we intended versus what happens, like you just explained, that there was intention to have standards put in addition to this, but it didn't happen. I think we're going to miss an opportunity if we don't really hone in on the narrative that goes along with this and what we intend to do. Okay. So, when we, when we put out the draft plan, um, we will be able to sort of work on whether that reflects your intentions or needs more work, what kinds of work that we can have on that um, rather than you know running right into an adoption process. Um, so um, do you have any other thoughts about these nodes of density or other considerations that we should take into account um, in terms of how this gets mapped. So last time I went to Rio, did we go back to that or went to sunlight? So. Yeah, so the Midtown Brackenridge plan essentially recommends and goes the, the recommended design standards would be in revisiting and revision of the Rio overlay. So where the Rio overlay in some ways now doesn't, um, it, it allows you know, higher building, taller buildings in many regards than what the design standards would encourage. And it doesn't, it doesn't get to the same nuance that the design, design recommendations from the Midtown Recognition Plan recommended. Right, it's a concern, right? So it, it's much more of a blunt tool than we are concerned that it would be an overlay on this. So to go back to the yeah. Yeah, the real is it is a bit more blunt than what would come out of these recommendations. Um, and it wouldn't be to add another layer on top of that to another zoning overlay. It would, it would be a revision or a replacement. And that would that would have to come through the process. How do we hold on to that thread when it comes to this would be part of the, the next step? So it would be a if the city council, when city council adopts the midtown plan, um, at some point thereafter, we would recommend as soon as possible that a process be initiated. That would involve, we would recommend that the neighborhood association be involved. In so if you're the president of the neighborhood association. There's also some discussion with CPS to put underground utilities. <coughs> Yeah, 
and think we were talking a little bit about again some of the historic buildings again that are between Broadway and Avenue B and are those again I it's, it's not my expertise but I know them and I love them. Um, are those are the high purple, darker purple that are we're gonna have to then challenge be challenged by historic or we should have these challenged. So there is some places where there's yeah, buildings that have some essential character, I would say like two cardinal character, um, that are in both the lighter purple and the darker purple. And that's the case throughout the town. And the idea is that even with with a, a recommendation for more density in general, it doesn't mean that the building uh, has to be replaced. And more density or um, a more intense use, like an office instead of a, a residence, um, can even make preservation of a building more financially viable in some cases. And so we're going to have a map uh, that identifies um, not places where we're recommending historic, official historic designations, but we're calling them uh, uh, historic character pockets. Um, but we're calling out places that you know, have a fine urban grain, it the essential character of the area, and that really should be a part of the future and um, and not be replaced. That would contribute to the diversity of, of what's otherwise a high density place. Uh, so that's the case over here San Pedro as well, um, in some locations. Where you have bunks and going over to WB. <clears throat> looks like it's purple, and that is a historic home in sight. Old fashioned pretensions. Just go up on, uh, go over the green, oh. and that right there is a historic building. That's, the, that's actually one that just that's came to mind. A point. A point was a white building next to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's a difference between preserving something and building all around it so you can't see it visually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and there's, a, there's also you know adaptive reuse of something that's existing as well. Um, so again, the narrative that was to stay, the narrative around that would be more and more important to all the intended. Make sure you know that with a historic essential narrative and historic character. Um, yeah, we're very worthy. The other thing that should be discouraged probably is uh, not alcoholic restaurants, but I call them sit and shoot joints here. You gotta be real careful about that. I don't think there's any issues along I don't think there are that many issues along that Broadway, but as things start to develop in a positive way, you get all these things. I mean, you can remain all their type of license, but so, um, places that serve dinner and alcohol can be, you know, they can make important contributions to the vibrancy of a place. Sure. Um, and we haven't heard that those should be explicitly discouraged on Broadway. Um, but it sounds like you're, also, you're speaking as much to sort of like the qualities and the character. Right. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's important. Um, there's limitations to what a land use plan can do in that regard, other than that allowing more density than just a standalone bar would encourage an owner to actually do something larger than just a cheap standalone bar. A lot to do with community involvement, walkability, and all that stuff. Yeah, family friendliness, quality of life. I think it's important to have a relationship between vacancy and commercial opportunity in a given building. And that building commercial opportunity seems to lend itself to more vacancy. Whereas enabling more commercial opportunities gives fair opportunity to occupy and vacant properties. Yeah, so flexibility. Yeah. But within sort of within the vision of what the character of the place is supposed to be. 
as I look at that, it's, it's already you know, being used. <coughs> yeah. Some of the I think it's. I am at a table discussion. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't see that very weird. No, I was just saying that what I know of that neighborhood is it, there aren't that many big buildings at all. It's not that safe, but it's real big. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of bigger buildings. There's a lot of space around buildings, a lot more space around buildings in terms of the uh, parking areas uh, that might represent a bigger opportunity. Uh, for more people to be able to use the area. It, what you were saying reminded me of this uh, a round table discussion I had with some Yankee Park residents in the fall, where they were talking about the number of bookstores and fine grained retail uses along Broadway and just how they thought that um, it shouldn't all just be replaced. You know, that, that those kinds of things contribute uniqueness that sort of local to businesses, the sure. things that look interesting. In the light. So, it's, those are things that we've heard. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so in the, the old, the older, it, it, well, it's existing still, this is the official land use map until it changes. Uh, there's two categories of mixed use. And as Tim said, over here there's three. And so this generally provides for, it allows for us to be a little bit more intentional about the degree of mixed use. This uh, category of mixed use didn't, it didn't describe like a, an actual uh, number of dwelling units. Um, it was just more a little bit relative, relativistic. <coughs> a higher than lower. But, but Gary, help me understand because I thought there were some additional ones here. I think there's low density as well as regular that aren't on this map. Mm -hmm. Oh, is yeah, low density over here. Oh, currently, don't we have like R four and R five? Oh yeah, so there's several other uh, rep cat land use categories mm -hmm. that you can see, for example, in the neighborhood areas of Mankey Park. And uh, for the purpose of visual cleanliness and, and talking about Broadway, it's um, maybe to a fault in terms of breaking up this conversation into discrete parts, but I try to focus on Broadway. And so I didn't include every other category. Like, there's categories that only allow commercial but not residential. Right. Um, didn't put those here. Okay. Yeah. So those are all non residential, these are all non residential. But is that what is in comparison? These, these would both include a mix, a potential mix of residential and commercial. It does And these two? Oh, those two. Each of them, could, they could all have a mix in on the same property of residential and commercial uses. It's just that with neighborhood mixed use, the amount of residential density is much more limited. And the only thing I would, you know, I would be cautious about this moving forward and thinking about how, how we recognize the land use map. It's that when you have residential density of maybe what, like I said, what you would see in a townhome development, like up to 18 units per acre, it might be harder to incentivize um, some of those more public benefits, like a plaza or a passageway or, um, or public art or something like that to, to sort of make that part of the development process of getting that from a developer if there's tight limits on, on the amount that they can develop and make money on. Um, but, um, but I think that until there's design standards, like we were talking about, that it provides some assurance as to quality um, and the real intentions, and that those are incorporated into a code that, um, you know, maybe that's okay. I understand that's increasingly important. So, thank you. Any <coughs> thoughts about this before we move on?
So one section of the plan is going to be about amenities um, and some of the things that we want to see that could actually uh, explicitly improve quality of life um, and help make sure that the growth that comes to the town is actually a good thing um, and, isn't, and isn't just uh, the impacts. And so there's going to be a section that includes a map um, and lots of photos and text describing the kind of things that we want to see. And I just want to essentially preview this for you. It's partly based on our discussion at the last meeting, which was brief at the end. We broke into two groups and, and did some mapping. But it's also based on discussions since the beginning of the planning process. And we have some more work to do to refine this and make sure it's right because there's some things missing. Um, but it describes um, places where there should be priority pedestrian infrastructure improvements, like along Josephine, for example. Um, there's uh, enhanced, track, uh, enhanced tree canopy and landscaping. Um, so for example, on the map from our last meeting, Flores was identified, and so was Fredericksburg Road. Uh, Josephine Street has been through all the processes, and I think we need to update that. Um, enhanced stormwater management and low impact development. That's a really hard one to express on the map, and it, it should really be applied throughout the entire watershed. Right? It's not just like a one place that you do it, you don't do it like right next to the river. So we've got to think about, about how we can make those recommendations. We talked about pedestrian safety and lighting. Um, so, for example, at Crockett Park, where Cypress intersects Main Street, um, and a couple of locations along Fredericksburg Road. Um, we talked about public art. Um, there's a lot of, or at least several public art opportunities from other neighborhood conversations we've had that need to be incorporated in this map, including some recommendations for public art up and down Broadway Street that are being formulated now by some other city departments. I'm trying to essentially reflect those recommendations and they align very well with the gateways that we talked about at uh, where the river that was San Antonio River Bank is closest to Broadway um, at the Mankey Park Green uh, entrance to Brackenridge Park and at Mulberry for example. Uh, we talked about healthy food access and some some places that planning team members added to the map, um, and we have a couple of extras that we need to reflect, uh, including some existing opportunities to better connect people with healthy food access. You know, there's a there's a uh, community garden at Mankey Park. Um, there's recommendations in the Mankey Park neighborhood plan to create uh, an enhanced trail with better landscaping through Mankey Park to connect Brackenridge Park with San Antonio Botanical Garden. But the plan was done before the King's Garden was done. So, you know, there's an opportunity that maybe add on to that recommendation and say, not only should we implement this plan for making park improvements, but let's allow people, let's encourage people to encounter the community garden uh, as well, um, not reflecting the existing recommendations because they're just good data. Eric, is there an upper layer that would be? you can do for the corridor plan. Is there an overlay? Yeah, you know, eventually, you know, you get the corridor plan sitting over here, and its land use is a bigger concern, I think, for most of the neighborhoods. The essay corridors plan? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to break our land use plan. Uh, because that land use, you know, it has that depth mile around Berkeley. The stations are going to be, and if you put one there at Hilda um, Brand and Broadway, for example, half mile in is put on the land park. Yeah, so the Midtown plan is going to have the official future land use now uh, when it's adopted, you know, when it's city council adopts it. And so the, the SA Corridors plan, uh, the land use map, um, those were recommendations, but it was really it was off, those recommendations were optimized to support the highest quality transit service, and didn't have all of the the balancing and broader consideration of all community values that we uh, have had time to work into the town plan. And so, 
Um, I could generally characterize the Big Town draft feature land use map as being a step back from, in, in, in most places, some of the densities that were recommended in the SA corridors. But I'd be happy to, to bring it to the next one. We also talked about signage and wayfinding um, and some social gathering and community event spaces, um, the preservation pockets that I was talking about. Not necessarily a recommendation for a historic district, but just calling out, hey, there's places that have a sort of older, finer grained character. There might be a couple of historic landmarks in the area. Um, and this could be a really valuable addition to what's otherwise a higher density place. Um, and so we have to add several of these from community conversations that I had uh, to the map. But one, one is here at um, Poplar, it's about, it's about Poplar and Dewey, I think, south of Cypress and east of San Pedro. There's some law firms, uh, a couple of apartments. And homes. And homes. And the just. Um, so we're looking forward to being able to share this as part of the whole package of the whole plan so you can see how it all fits together um, as soon as possible and, um, and then having more conversations about it and how it relates to the neighborhood priorities, the land use map, and the like. Yeah, um, up and down San Pedro, I know it's an ugly street to drive up and down through and I thought we could talk about you know, adding you know, slowing it down and, or adding more trees and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I guess I know transportation wise it's one of the big corridors that we're talking about. So is that the reason that the kind of shows up there is that you know, local? That is a mapping mistake. That does not have tree canopy and uh, the, the sort of green cloud running along it. The San Pedro is clearly been a prairie. For in terms of improving pedestrian safety, uh, the pedestrian experience for people using transit. Um, I visited twice with residents of Via Tranquisi. Um, and yeah, I mean, to, to hear them talk about you know, being out of the heat on San Pedro, um, to visit a friend at a restaurant, um, or to wait for the bus, or to get splashed by cars going by very quickly. Uh, very compelling stories uh, that I heard there. And when you combine it with what seems to be direction towards incorporating high quality transit, maybe something where there's like buses every 15 minutes that don't have to wait, um, wait in long lines of traffic themselves. Yeah. In that case, for major improvements to San Diego. We also talk about it being maybe a kind of market sort of hub for some sort of culture. Yeah. So we talked about. I think we were speaking for the hub uh, first, right? So we're trying to decide. So there's been several conversations about a potential uh, arts, arts uh, like a state designated uh, arts and culture district, um, and we've talked about it. And other city departments, uh, including the one that Ruben McCoy here works for, and have been working with community members to think about where and stakeholders where those might be. There's been discussion about having one centered on St. Mary's. We've had discussions with art studios and artists about having one that's oriented to Fredericksburg Road. Um, there's compelling cases throughout the city for like, which should be the next one to be designated an arts and culture district. And my understanding is that the arts and culture department is going through a process to think through how they can fairly and, um, and, and based on principles um, work with artists and stakeholders to designate those. But someone's holding on. So holding on to the concept of doing. Well, oh, yeah. The yeah. Denver District folks have already submitted to the state of Texas Arts Department. But yes. Yeah. Um, also, update on that, they included Flores uh, also. As yeah. Part of yeah, there's like a whole cluster of craft businesses in Flores that they have their own Facebook page, actually. <laughs> um, and so I, I think. But the general trend I've heard that what started in some cases is conversations about more isolated places. The more community members join the conversation, the more people realize, hey, there's, you know, there's a theater in St. Pedro Springs Park. 
there's these crap businesses on Florida, so let's let's include more. Um, but uh, that's something that we're going to try to speak to without um, getting ahead of ourselves and the work of other city partners. I think in terms of the cultural component, I mean, there is Espinosa, there is the theater, there is the, the park, the, the oldest park, in the, the oldest park or something like that. There's the San Pedro College, the largest. There's a lot of people there. Is there. There's not a chance to be a citizen to be heard. That's a good question. So we talked about, we actually talked about that. And um, uh, at least a few planning team members expressed that they'd like to have time at the end of the meeting for citizens to be heard. Okay. Um, they can't have time to sleep. Have gotten through the conversation. This is the last topic that I was hoping to discuss. That we can uh, we can move on to doing that. I don't want to necessarily set an expectation that this is something that would happen at every planning team meeting or um, at a, the West Side planning team meeting or the downtown planning team meeting. Um, but yes, I want to be responsive. So let me just run through these with you. If you will allow me. Some of the next steps are that we're going to place the draft plan online. I understand the online commenting functions on all the pages, uh, including on the maps. If you could click on, on the maps. Um, we're going to be trying to meet with original neighborhood planning team members um, and other people from the neighborhoods, as they have been doing, um, to talk more about um, the draft plan and how we can continue improving it. And the neighborhood profile and priorities, um, understanding perspective on the, the older neighborhood plans um, and the like. Uh, so, as I said, visiting neighborhood associations, and amidst that, continuing to really try to offer other opportunities as well, where we'll go out and try to encounter people and give them a chance to uh, weigh in on what we're doing if they're not, um, if they don't go to neighborhood associations, for example. We'll have a, a third community meeting at least. Um, we'll have another planning team meeting, um, and then you know, we'll, we'll make changes to the plan in response to the public feedback again and more discussions that we have together. And then after all that, it will take about three months to make presentations to the city council subcommittee for, for the comprehensive plan, the planning commission. And ultimately, ask for city council approval. That's, that's a fairly lengthy process. Um, so, with that being said, um, if we'd like to have an opportunity for neighborhood folks to speak, um, I think that um, it should be an opportunity where everybody would have a chance. And so, how do you guys think that we should do this? Should there be should we ask people to roughly stick to a time limit or just invite people to try to be brief and give, every, give each other a chance? Yeah. And Why don't anyone to speak first? Why don't you break the hands of who wants to speak? Yeah. Yeah. People speak and try to keep your comments. Two, three. Three or four people. So we just start and we have enough time. No, it's too many. And George had his thought about it way before the minutes, and then he Well, I'm here for I've been a member of the Planning Department of the Association since it was formed in 1979. I was on the planning team for our original neighborhood plan. I was on the planning team for our current neighborhood plan, which was adopted in September of 2001. Uh, I was on the planning team for the uh, neighborhood Conservation District. I'm currently serving on the, the update of the Neighborhood Conservation District. For those of you who are from neighborhood associations, how many neighborhood associations have neighborhood plans? Okay. And, and what I'm hearing you say here is those plans are going away. We're trying to integrate the recommendations in those plans that are still neighborhood properties into the new town plan. Well, uh, 
Let me make a suggestion. I mean, our, our plan has goals in five areas. It's got probably uh, 40 goals divided into those areas. Many of those have nothing to do with land use. And, and we spent a year doing the update on the plan. There were about 40 people from the neighborhood on the committee. Uh, we had meeting after meeting after meeting. And I don't, I don't think we want to do that again. So what I think we should do is keep the neighborhood plans in place and say, to the extent there's a conflict between the area plan and the neighborhood plan, the area plan prevails. Because what we use these plans for, and I think all the neighborhoods do this, is number one, it's a lobbying tool. Okay, when something happens in the neighborhood, we can use this, we can go to the developer, we can go to the boards and commissions, we can go to city council and say, we either agree or don't agree with this, and it's in our neighborhood plan. Okay, and the other thing we use it for, I don't know how other neighborhoods do it, but uh, our, our board members have a limited two-year terms. So, so we we lose some continuity on the board, right? We don't we don't have people that are there like me for 38 years. This is something that the neighborhood association and the board can go to and say, okay, have we ever dealt with this issue? What did we think about it in the past? These plans need to stay in place. So, okay. uh, my name is Jody Brooks, and I'm uh, from Metro Park. And I agree totally with uh, George Bryce. Uh, so I won't restate that. But I guess I have a concern, and I think I heard you say here about the land use maps, the quarter land use maps, and the Broadway land use maps. How does that all correlate with the town? And you're saying the town trumps everything. Yeah, I hear you say that. When the city council adopts the town plan and the land use map that's in it, that will be the official land use map for all of the areas that are inside of the town. So you did say the trust, so it will be the official one. So, and how and who who do I work with? Do I work with Butch for uh, some of those areas uh, on the map that I don't agree with, especially where uh, close where I live? And is that where I work with Butch on that? So uh, for suggestions on the land use map, some of the darker purple that's up north of Hildebrand and Broadway. So I would encourage you to work with Butch if that's how you feel more comfortable, but you're also welcome to continue emailing me directly as we have him for questions or to register concerns. Uh, if you'd like to do it, uh, emailing me and Butch at the same time is a great way to make sure that we're both on the same page about what your concerns are. Um, and I'm concerned about some of that purple. It's different. If you look at the definition, that the, it's different than the definition that we have for some of the commercial that's in our land, that's in our uh, neighborhood plan. So it, makes, it allows it to be much more dense and not neighborhood friendly. Yeah. So that's stuff that we can continue talking about. Uh, and definitely, yeah, it'd be good to explain much. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the future land use map for the city. Uh, the official future land use map was updated in 2011, and it replaced the, the land use map um, that was created in the Mankey Park plan uh, for, for areas adjacent to Broadway. So um, the, the properties around Davisport that are right next to Broadway are already designated mixed use in the official future land use map, and um, I definitely would like to you know, look at the actual details of it with you. Okay. We can look at the differences in the categories and whether there's differences in the extent to which the mixed use designation extends in distance from Broadway. Um, I can tell you that the, the draft recommendation that we talked about today for discussion purposes, the mixed use category is actually kept closer to Broadway than on the existing adopted feature land use map. So it represents kind of pulling both things back to Broadway and less encroachment. Um, but we can let's continue talking about yeah. it. And the last one is how are you how is traffic being addressed? For example as you see the high density, the dark purple with Hildebrand, it's only two lanes on each side. And I know we, we can think that people are going to take the bus. But um, I don't really think that it's going to happen much. So we're putting these high density, 
high heights in places along Broadway. It's already dense. And so is there any kind of traffic study that y'all are doing? I, mean, I just don't understand that you put more in a place right there at AT&T. A, a dark purple high density, and, and we have problems with Hildebrand backing up already. So, our planning process for making the land use map doesn't include um, traffic studies. Um, as of now, traffic studies are addressed at a later stage in uh, the planning and development process. And I know that there's concerns about, for example, that not being addressed with IDZ zoning. Um, and that there's sort of a loophole, and that, you know, for example, Joe Bravo from Westport Alliance has talked about cumulative traffic impacts as opposed to just uh, analyzing them on a case by case basis. So, our plan, the scope of our plan is not, just to say, say the plan does not include a traffic analysis. But I think a land use map needs to happen. Thank you. Um, my name is Denise Homer. I am from Government Hill, and uh, I'm the newly elected board president of our alliance. Unfortunately, we have not attended any of your meetings until today. Um, we're trying to catch up. We're a little late to the party. We were never invited by our previous board. So we're trying to get all the information from uh, a lot of different entities, a lot of different organizations in San Antonio. And one thing, and I'm very happy about it, we do have meetings that I hope you're going to do sweet. That's right. Um, but uh, listening to all this information, being part of Government Hill, we are in the middle of the area that is completely being bombarded by developers because of Pearl, because of Broadway, including the fact that we're going to have a huge discussion tomorrow at HDRC with a proposed 19 story skyscraper. By Gray Street, um, on the corner of Newell and Broadway, which means our traffic and our neighborhood will be affected by not only construction, but the proposed 19 story skyscraper that will have to have access through our neighborhood through 35, going along Pan American Highway down to Alamo Street to get to Broadway turns into one lane traffic. And you're mentioning traffic? That's our traffic. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with it right now because of our own college being built around the corner from us. We have a huge amount of traffic in our neighborhood with rattle trucks, 18 wheelers. That's before we have a proposed 600 employees coming to our neighborhood, coming through our probably four streets of neighborhood roads. All that development will affect our neighborhood. Not only is it our neighborhood, but we do have a historic section of our neighborhood right in the middle that we're dealing with zoning right now. Single, single lots, developers, they just see money. The land use value in our neighborhood alone has gone up over four folds. Some members of our residents pay more in land use taxes than their mortgage. So and that's, is there something you want to ask? Well, I'm just asking. Because I, I'm not hearing everything right now because of the traffic. We, I'm saying we're, we're late to the party. You just said the traffic's not involved. I'm truly concerned. I want a TPR about traffic. So we can talk afterwards if you like, but that's okay. not addressed in this plan. But we don't know what the plan is because we're seeing them all affected in the high density. It's Your purple. concerns are my concerns on the West Ward. We can talk after. Okay. This is what we've been getting all along. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Here, just to that effect, I don't want to belabor the point, but the cumulative traffic impact analysis, when we are imposing this uh, well, higher density areas uh, that we discussed on Broadway and Hillcrank, can we find that information? Can you give us that information so that we know? Um, because I'm, I'm certainly um, receptive to their concerns, and I think I would like to know if we were to recommend changes of land use in that particular area. Current Traffic impact is XYZ proposed if this land use goes into effect would also increase it by a percentage, would potentially you know, have this type of negative impact, positive impact, whatever it's worth. So that kind of analysis is not part of the scope of our planning. Um, 
well, our contract and service of the right consultant. Yeah. So it's not part of the budget of the city. And there is a document that may prove beneficial for the planning team. Um, so TCI just requested the MPO conduct this exact traffic study for almost these exact areas that you're looking at. Uh, it's an $8 million contract, and they're going through a different consultant. Um, and that's about a six-month process, so maybe a little too late, but um, you may want to talk to Trish and we have that about getting access to that study as it's being performed and whatever data they're coming up with. So to that point, quickly, so it sounds like I'm not asking for anyone to do something new or to go through an analysis process that's going to cost additional time and money from the consultant. Certainly, there has to be information available um, that we can get to the committee so that they have some idea of what a potential impact would be. I'll talk with our consultants about it and, and our team about okay. if there's some information that we can look at yeah. um, or, or bring up. Would be helpful and not just out of context or uh, sort of related but not but not useful. Right. And then um, I also wanted to add we have to be very mindful about the difference between land use and zoning. Sure. Because we're looking at land use and these plans are literally 10 years. So we're saying the future if we were to have a future land use for this area, this is say like 10 years is what it would look like. So the zoning could stay the same for the next 10 years if the property owner decides that no, I'm good, I don't want to change anything. And so, if we, if we attempt to do sort of a traffic study based upon this, it will never really truly reflect the difference between what's there now, what could happen, what could change, what a developer may choose to do, things like that. Yeah. So that's why it's done at that moment in time when something's actually going to happen. Because remember, actually, this is 10 years, so right. in 10 years this is what it could be, and landscape changes as well, and they evolve to keep up with the time. There was one done in person before that somebody had the one that was done on Broadway last year or so. And I appreciate all those comments. I think you know one of the things that I'm hearing is that they're concerned about what the impact is. And I'm not suggesting that we know what the numbers are going to bring and what that you know potential traffic could be. But I think it's important to address that. And it's important to say, you know, if we go with this high level land use, uh, future land use, that it could potentially go to this because how are we going to make a recommendation or a decision on something you know that potentially could or could not happen without that piece of information. But there's two lines here uh, and just to speak to government bills and what sort of lines. There's some current activity that's causing pain. Correct. Yes. And, and so, so it's that as well as the light of the future, right? Yeah. So um, not to mix metaphors, but um, so trying to figure out what's happening currently as well as what might happen. It's really the question, it's not just one or the other. Right. So, when there's, after the, after the plan is adopted, and we're talking about trying to read and rezone uh, areas adjacent to San Pedro. Thank you. Okay, and uh, again, since you are, if there are ways to synthesize, you know, a lot of those exchanges you might be having in the name, Yeah, so I, I'd like to try to share as much raw information as possible. It, it, it does take, um, you know, the, the way that we have it set up now is that we, we use that information and come up with the draft proposals to reflect to reflect what we heard. Um, writing, you know, like a memo about each neighborhood visit, you know, it's, it's an extra, it involves another step of interpretation of the raw comments. Uh, and it has to be polished and look really good for it to put it out there to the public. And so uh, there are some limitations in terms of the time and trade-offs with you know, being able to visit another place to talk to people versus writing, writing the summary. But I, I appreciate that it would be helpful to have as much of that info as possible. And, and I, again, appreciate all these needs you're having. And, and I was also glad to hear that we're going to some of those senior housing 
areas. So if there's a way to even reach out to more, because as you said, the the plan, the, the preliminary plan will be online. So a lot of seniors aren't online, right? And yeah. And so how do you reach that community as and the working class are working for that might not have access as well. So it'll take extra work in the federal government? Yes, I know that. Yeah. It'll take extra work, yeah. And um, it's actually a, it seems like an interesting and fun opportunity that via train QC and Parkview apartments have um, have computer literacy classes where anyone can come and you know explore a web page, show you how to register a vote. I was thinking that it would be a really good uh, opportunity to go and use use the big town plan leverage. Should I use that as an assessment? Yeah, they can search. Yeah, I can also have the first copy. Yeah, some people right there, old. They want it face to face and they want it the old fashioned way. And, and it's also the what, you know, when we talk about walkability, when we talk, you know, we're, we're going back to what we used to have. So people are exchanging and getting to know each other, not being afraid of their neighbors, you know. So the elders also have something they unite us yeah. about all the time. Given all the concern about traffic, and particularly Broadway, it's too bad that Lou's not here. Maybe we need a presentation on the curves. And what they're thinking about the mulberry sauce. We're not yet. We're talking about it. We're yeah. about, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about going and walking and passing along with the bus. Do it. Yeah. See what yeah. it's like. Thank you for thank you for coming tonight. I think we're gonna let the planning team go. So it's at 8:30. Thank you for your time. Thank you.